ओके डन वेलकम गाइस नाउ वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द गैस्ट्रो इंडस्ट्रियल पैथोलॉजी राइट now in this class let's continue with the malabsorption disorders in yesterday's class we have discussed about the non infectious causes of the malabsorption disorders what are the non infectious causes we have seen that is the celiac sprue the whipple's disease okay celiac sprue whipple's disease pseudo membranous colitis okay giardiasis amebiasis we have seen so the, they are the infections okay which are causing the malabsorption which are leading to the malabsorption now in this class i will be mainly concentrating on non infectious causes of malabsorption okay right non infectious causes of malabsorption what are the non infectious causes under this non infectious causes the first disease that i am going to discuss here is the celiac sprue okay is a celiac sprue sir now what exactly is this celiac sprue first we will discuss about the celiac sprue later i will be discussing about the inflammatory bowel diseases okay celiac sprue first i will be discussing about this later i will be discussing about the inflammatory bowel diseases there are two types of inflammatory bowel diseases one is crohn's disease okay crohn's disease other is ulcerative colitis okay ulcerative colitis ulcerative colitis as well as the crohn's disease now first let's discuss about the celiac disease or celiac sprue okay celiac sprue what exactly is this celiac sprue what you should know for your exams if you know this much that will be enough sir let me explain what it is see normally when you eat food okay imagine as an indian we we take food right now we take wheat now in the wheat grains there is something called as gluten gluten is present normally in most of the people sir indigenous population the gluten is not going to cause any problem but there are certain people especially in the western world those people this gluten they will identify this gluten as an antigen whenever they take this food this gluten is recognized as an antigen so what they what they will do they will start the immune reaction so they will produce the antibodies against this gluten okay so what happens okay what happens is whenever the pap whenever the persons okay whenever the persons are taking the gluten now the antibodies are going to be produced again as the gluten close the door door okay so the antibodies are produced again as the gluten now these antibodies what they will do is they will cause a damage they will cause a damage to the villi which are present in the intestines so the villus will undergo atrophy when the villi are getting atrophied the proper absorption of the substances are not going to happen okay now let's begin one by one first see this celiac disease okay celiac sprue okay sir celiac sprue sir now the celiac sprue is also called as what is the other name for celiac sprue gluten sensitive enteropathy okay so the gluten sensitive enteropathy sir look at the gluten sensitive enteropathy right now why exactly the word gluten sensitive enteropathy i have explained you the patients these persons are sensitive okay these persons are sensitive to this gluten they will produce the antibodies against this gluten sir okay it will produce antibodies against this gluten the antibody is not only go and attack the gluten but it will cause the inflammation in the intestines it will cause the inflammate inflammation in the intestines leading to the atrophy of the villi when never the villi are not there proper absorption of the substances are not going to happen that will lead to malabsorption okay now let's write one by one this gluten is present where present in okay the gluten it is present in cereals Okay, it's present in the cereals. It's present in the cereals like what? Wheat, rye, barley, oats, rice. Okay, rice. All the cereals. These are all the cereals which are okay. These are all the cereals which contains this gluten. All the cereals contain the gluten, and that gluten 
is the one which is recognized as the antigen by this patient. Now, I am saying that this, these patients are going to produce the antibodies. What are the antibodies? What are the antibodies? Antibodies produced. Okay, what are the antibodies which are produced against this gluten? Okay, there are three types of antibodies that are going to be produced in this disease. There are three types of antibodies. One, anti glidin. Okay, these are anti glidin antibodies. Anti glidin antibodies. This glidin is actually a component of gluten. Glidin is a component of the gluten, sir. Anti, very, very important endomycel. Okay, anti endomycel antibodies and anti tissue transglutaminase antibodies. Okay, anti glidin antibodies, anti endomycel antibodies, and anti tissue transglutaminase antibodies. These are the three antibodies which are going to be produced in this condition. These patients, if you check the blood of these patients, now these three types of antibodies are going to be seen, sir. Okay, now what is the investigation of choice for this disease? When you do the invest, what is the investigation of choice? That's a biopsy. Okay, that's a biopsy, sir. Intestinal biopsy. Whenever you do the intestinal biopsy, what is visible, sir? The villi. The villi will show you the image. The villi are going to be atrophied. Okay, so there is flattening or loss of flattening or loss. Okay, flattening or loss of microvilli. Okay, flattening or loss of microvilli going to be seen. Now, in this celiac pro, this see, imagine I am the patient who is having a celiac pro. Okay. Now, not only there will be malabsorption in me, not only the symptoms of not only the GA symptoms will be seen, but if you look at my skin, there will be like you know rashes, there will be rashes, sir. Okay, herpetiform rashes are going to be seen. Okay, like you know, dermatitis inflammation is going to be seen. So this condition is called as the skin involvement. Okay, the skin involvement, these antibodies are not only just going to attack the, gliden, uh, the gluten which is present in the intestines, because of this antibodies, the antibodies deposition inside the skin can lead to dermatitis herpetiformis. Dermatitis, inflammation of the skin, herpetiformis. Herpetiformis. Okay, so dermatitis herpetiformis, it is seen in which condition? So, dermatitis herpetiformis, it is a complication because of celiac sprue. In celiac sprue, okay, the patients who are having celiac sprue, they will also have, have the skin manifestations, that is the dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay, now, what is the treatment that one should give to these patients? Okay, what can you do? So, these are genetically predisposed patients. Whenever they take this wheat again and again, antibodies are going to be produced, loss of flattening of the villi is going to be seen, malabsorption, whenever the food is not properly getting up, whenever the food is not properly getting absorbed, that will lead to diarrhea. The patient is going to have the diarrhea, no proper absorption of the food, right? So, what is the treatment that is done for these patients is restrict these patients, okay, restrict themselves, like you know, restrict these patients from taking that substances which are having this uh, the gluten okay so avoid gluten containing foods avoid gluten containing foods simple avoid gluten containing foods so they should not take rice wheat barley oats okay they should not take like you know oats they should like but which of the following in one of the pg exam questions this question was asked What's the better alternative? Which cereal they can take? Okay, they, can, they should not take like, you know, wheat, wheat, rice, barley, oats, rice. Okay, they should not take this. But they can take maize. Okay? They can replace their diet with the maize. So, maize do not contain gluten. So, maize is the best alternative. That's, that's the MCQ. Next. Sir, what about the skin involvement? Dermatitis herpetiformis. So, what is the drug of choice for this dermatitis herpetiformis? The drug of choice for this condition is <coughs> Dapsone. Okay, Dapsone, sulfonamide drug. Dapsone is a drug of choice for the treatment of dermatitis herpetiformis. Okay, so all the same things which we have seen. See, celiac fruit is also called as gluten sensitive enteropathy, you know it. Gluten is present in cereals like wheat, rice, barley, oats. Okay, maize, see, they go maize. 
is an alternative user for this patient. Mace is an alternative user for this patient. Antibodies present are anti gliadin, anti mandomycin, and anti tissue rosmodermin. These antibodies, investigation of choice is biopsy. Biopsy shows what? Flattening or loss of microvilli. Skin involvement is dermatitis herpid formation. And the treatment for skin involvement is the dapsone. Simple. Done. Okay. So, I have completed the celiac proof. Celiac proof. Now, after celiac proof, okay, look here. Celiac proof is completed. After celiac proof, what we have to discuss? We have to discuss about the inflammatory bowel diseases. Okay, IBD, inflammatory bowel diseases. What are the two inflammatory bowel diseases? Crohn's. First is a Crohn's disease, and second one is ulcerative colitis. Okay, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now let's begin with the Crohn's disease. Okay, the first inflammatory bowel disease that I am going to discuss here is Crohn's disease. Okay, now regarding Crohn's disease for your exam, what are the important points that you should know? Okay. Which part of GAT is going to be affected in Crohn's disease? It's an inflammatory bowel disease, right? There is inflammation, so there is inflammation. Why? We don't know. This inflammatory bowel disorders, what is the exact reason for this inflammatory bowel disorders? No one doesn't know. Idiopathic, we don't know. Okay. Now, which part of the GAT can be affected? Any part. Any part can be affected. Okay, any part of the GAT is going to be affected. Okay, that's the first point which I want you to know. Any part of the intestines can be affected, sir. Okay. But intestines or any part can be, can be affected. But important point is usually any part can be affected, but usually rectum. Okay, usually rectum is going to be spared. Okay, usually rectum is going to be spared, which means rectum is not affected, and that's the MCQ which was asked in the exam. Okay, rectum is not affected. Now, in this Crohn's disease, the patient is going to have the ulcers, sir. Even in the mouth, ulcers are there. Okay, even in the intestines, this inflammation is going on and ulcers are going to be there. So, how the ulcers are going to be look like? In Crohn's disease, the ulcers, right, the ulcers are going to look like this. The ulcers are going to look like this, sir. So, they are looking like a snake, serpiginous ulcers, longitudinal, serpiginous ulcers. So, serpiginous ulcers are going to be seen in Crohn's disease. Okay, next, what else? Any part of the GAT can be affected from the mouth till to the colon. Any, any part can be affected. Usually, rectum is not affected. Usually, it is not affected. See, for example, if this part, imagine this is the intestine. Okay, if this part is affected, then this part is not going to be affected. Then this part is affected. Then this part is not affected. Means, the inflammation is not going to be continuous. The involvement is not going to be in continuous nature. It is not continuous involvement. Here affected, here not affected. Here affected, here it is not affected. Okay. Even you can look here in this image. So, this part is affected. This part is affected. This part is affected. This and this part affected. But there are normal healthy areas in between. So, which means is it a continuous involvement or is it, are the lesions are going to be skip lesions? So, these lesions are going to be skip lesions. Okay. These lesions, they are going to be skip lesions okay not continuous involvement it is the other skip lesions okay skip involved uh, like you know the lesions are going to be skipping now what else you should uh, you need to know sir any part can be affected okay usually rectum is spared not affected but which what is the most common site that uh, one thing i forgot what is the most common site in the crohn's disease it is the ileum. Okay. Ileum is the most common site for the Crohn's disease. Sir. Crohn's disease. Next. So, it is an example of inflammatory bowel disease, right? Inflammation is there. Inflammatory bowel disease. Now, under the microscope, when you put it under the microscope, when you take a biopsy and when you put it under the microscope, inflammation is seen okay. But is it an example of granulomatous inflammation or non-granulomatous inflammation? So, Crohn's start with something like this, right? C, right? I used to remember, I used to make it like this. Okay. I will make just like this. So, C is becoming like a G. So, remember Crohn's, very, very important. Crohn's is an example of granulomatous, which means granulomas are going to be seen. Granulomatous inflammation. Crohn's is an example of what? It's an example of granulomatous inflammation, sir. Right? Now, this inflammation is there, okay. So, your intestines are made up of what? Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis serosa. Which layer of the GAT is going to be affected? What do you think? Which layer of the GAT is going to be affected? 
see it's not the superficial inflammation crohn's disease all the layers are going to be uh, like you know inflamed which means the inflammation is a transmural inflammation trans mural inflammation Well, the inflammation is going to be transmural in nature. Transmural involvement will be there. Okay. Next, when you look grossly, when you do endoscopy and when you look grossly, so this is how the intestines are going to look like. So this is how the intestines are going to look like. Okay, because of the inflammation. So they go. Now they are looking like a cobblestones. Now they are looking like a cobblestones, right? So how the mucosa is? The mucosa is giving cobblestone appearance. Now some students will have a doubt, sir. What is a cobblestone? Now look here. This is, you have seen this, right? In your, uh, like, you know, most of the students, you guys are from foreign, right? So, cobblestones are the pavement, okay? So, this is, see, they go, how it is. It's a cobblestone mucosa, cobblestone appearance, okay? Gross appearance. What is the gross appearance? Cobblestone. Okay, cobblestone appearance is going to be seen, transmural involvement is going to be seen, least commonly affected side is rectum, most commonly affected side is ileum, sir. ileum, okay. Next, what else? So, there is inflammation going on, okay, there is inflammation going on, okay, Deco. now the inflammation is going on, the inflammation is going to be healed or not, just tell me, sir, ulcers are there, inflammation is going on, now, sir, in, inflammation is going to be healed or not, yes, inflammation is going to be healed, sir, now as the inflammation is healing, Scar formation is going to be there or not? Inflammation heals by scar formation. Scar formation is going to be there. So, whenever there is scar tissue that is getting formed, it's a fibers, right? Fibers. Fibers will, like, you know, contract the things. Now, because of this, actually, here, this is a mesentery, sir. You know, this is a mesentery. Now, because of this scar formation, the mesentric fat, the all this mesentric fat, this mesentric fat will be actually grown in, will be taken into the bubbles or going into the bubble, sir. Okay, this is called as creeping fat appearance. Creeping fat. Creeping fat appearance is seen in. Okay. See, first ulcers will be there. Ulcers are going to be healed by fibrosis. This fibrosis is going to pull up the surrounding area of the mesentery. The fibrosis is going to pull up the surrounding area of the mesentery. So, what happens? The mesentric fat, the mesentric fat is actually going to enter into the bowels. So, this is something called as creeping fat. Okay. So, first let me write ulcers. Ulcers are going to heal by fibrosis. So, due to this fibrosis, there is pulling up of of mesentric fat. Mesentric fat into bubbles. Bubbles means intestine, into the bubbles. That will give, like, you know, creeping fat appearance. Creeping means like it's creeping, like a creeper. Okay, so, like here, sir, they go, creeping fat, the fat is going to enter into the, see, they go, now here, it, let me show you very clearly, sir, this is a mesentric fat, right, see, here is the, like, you know, see, I, it, it, it's very clear that there is fibrosis happening, because of this fibrosis, they go, now the fat is actually going into the bubbles, okay, understood, see, they go. So, that's a, fat is creeping, the fat is creeping into the intestines, okay. So, this is creeping fat appearance, okay, done. So, creeping fat appearance is the one thing which is going to be seen and not only this, uh, let me add a few more important points. So, these patients, okay, the patient is going to have the ulcers, okay, cobblestone mucosa, ulcers are going to be seen, serpiginous ulcers are going to be seen. Now, is it going to be healed or not? Is it going to be healed? How it's going to be healed? With fibrosis. So, now what happened to the GIT lumen, tell me. Excessive amount of fibrosis, because so many number of ulcers, excessive amount of fibrosis is going to happen. Because of this excessive amount of fibrosis, that particular part of the intestine may undergo stricture formation, narrowing, stricture formation. Okay. So, that particular part of the intestine, you, here, let me, let me see, here, you see, they go. Because of excessive fibrosis, this particular part of the intestine have undergone stricture. Okay. Strictures are going to be formed. So, stricture means narrowing. Okay, narrowing. Sir. Now, because of that, see here, look here, the patient. See, this is the barium, sir. Okay, there is a barium contrast. 
in the entire intestines. In the intestines, there is a barium contrast. Now, this barium, they go here, this part of the intestine, you know, it ileum, ileum, the most common site. Now, it's looking like a small string. Why? Why? Because the lumen is very much narrowed. So, barium is going like a small string. So, it's going like a string because narrowed. Okay, that part of the intestine is narrowed. So, this is called as a string of Cantor sign. Okay, radiological appearance. Okay, histology, you know it. Histology, what it is? It is granulomatous inflammation. Okay. It's a granulomatous inflammation. What is the radiological finding? So, radiological finding is going to be string of Cantor. So, string of Cantor sign is seen in Ron's disease because of the narrowing or because of the stricture. Okay. Next, what else you need to know? Sir, histology okay, radiological finding okay, laboratory finding, labs. In the labs, do you find anything uh, like you know specific in this condition? So, these patients are having certain antibodies. Sir. These patients are having certain antibodies. Which antibodies? ASCA. Okay. These patients are going to have ASCA antibodies. So, you can ask me, what is this ASCA, sir? This is not ANCA, ASCA. Anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay. So, the, the patients are going to have the anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies. Anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae fungus. Okay. Anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies. We do, why? We don't know. Why they are there? We don't know. Okay. So, but these patients are going to be positive for anti-Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies. Okay. One by one, important points. Okay. Crohn's. It's an inflammatory bowel disease. It's a granulomatous inflammation of the intestines. Any part of the GID can be affected. Most common part is the ileum, ileum is going to be affected. Least common site is going to be rectum. That's the question which was asked. It's a granulomatous inflammation. Gross morphology is going to be cobblestone mucosa. Because of the edema, because of the edema, it's going to show the cobblestone mucosa, sir. Cobblestone appearance is going to be seen. There will be creeping fat appearance is going to be seen. The ulcers are going to be serpiginous, okay, serpent-like ulcers are going to be seen. Skip lesions, skip lesions, one part is affected, other part is going to be normal. Skip lesions, not a continuous involvement. Radiological appearance, string of cancer sign because of the strictures. Okay, next, histology, granulomatous, or the granulomas are going to be seen. In labs, what is seen? Antisaccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies are going to be positive. Antisaccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies. Okay, next, what is the hallmark, sir? What is the hallmark? Any idea guys, hallmark? Come on, fun word, any ideas? What is the hallmark feature of Crohn's disease? Come on, now, fun word, Ashutosh, fun word, Varun Kashyap, Dr. Metroid. Come on guys, come on, what is the hallmark? Come on, you should be answering them. What is the hallmark? So, these patients are going to develop the fistulas. Okay, these patients are going to develop the fistulas. Fistula, you know what a fistula, right? It's a transmural inflammation. Okay, it's a transmural inflammation, for example. They go. Now, imagine, these are the intestines. These are the intestines. This is how the intestines are. Okay, this is how the intestines are. Now, imagine, this is the segment that is affected. Okay, this is the segment that is affected. For example, this segment is affected, sir. Now, it's a transmural inflammation, right? So, the inflammation can lead to the perforations. So, this part of the, see, now, this part, in this part, there can be a perforation. For example, look here. Like this. So, fistulas. Fistulas can occur. Okay? Regional, regional fistulas. Possible. So, fistulas are the hallmark because it's a transmural inflammation again and again I'm repeating. Okay, anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae anti antibodies, granulomatous inflammation, string of cancer sign, creeping fat appearance, okay, creeping fat appearance, serpiginous ulcers, okay, stricture formation, okay, all these are the skip lesions, all these are the important points about the Crohn's disease. Just as a summary, I have given you in one slide, Deco, any part of the JD can be affected through, terminal limb is the most common site. Rectum is usually spared. Lesions are going to be skip lesions. Which wall layer is affected? Transmural inflammation. 
bubble store appearance is seen, creepy fat appearance, serpentine ulcers are seen. Okay, fibrosis lead to the stricture formation, giving string of canter sign, you know it. Hallmark is the fistula formation, histology, granulomatous inflammation, antibodies are anti-saccharomyces cervicae antibodies. Done. You know this much, more than, more than enough, sir. Okay, why it is happening, we don't know. Crohn's disease, idiopathic, we don't know. Okay, important points, we can say. Now, after this, the second inflammatory bowel disease, the second inflammatory bowel disease is ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis, the name is there, ulcerative colitis. Colon is going to be the most commonly affected, sir. Okay, look here. Not colon, uh, I will tell you. Dekho, here, this red color region, the red color region is most commonly affected. Now, just tell me, is it a continuous involvement or is it a skip lesion? Sir, it's looking continuously, right? There is a continuous involvement, continuous inflammation is there. So, the first point which I want you to know is, Right. So, in ulcerative colitis, okay, what are the points which uh, I want you to know? Okay, what are the points which I want you to know? Right. So, it's a colon, okay, is affected. The colitis, colon, affected. Okay. But how is this skip lesion now? Continuous. It's a continuous retrograde manner, continuous in a retrograde manner. Okay, first it will start in the distal part and the inflammation is going to spread to the proximal parts. So, continuous retrograde. Okay, continuous retrograde manner, sir. Okay, next. Sir, which layer is going to be affected? All the four layers are going to be affected. It's a superficial inflammation. It is a superficial inflammation, sir, which means only mucosa and submucosa. Only the mucosa and submucosa are involved, not the deeper layers. So, it is a superficial inflammation. Next. Sir, okay, inflammation, okay. Is it a granulomatous inflammation or non-granulomatous inflammation? Very, very important. It is a non-granulomatous inflammation. Histology. Non, yes, non-granulomatous. It's an example of non-granulomatous inflammation. Okay. So, first, the distal parts is going to be affected. Now, the inflammation will spread to the proximal part like this. Like this, like this. So, at the end of the day, all the colon will be affected. The entire colon will be affected. Leading to pancolitis. Okay. Continuous involvement will be there. Leading to what? Pancolitis. Okay. Leading to pancolitis. So that's the important point, sir. So mucosa is going to be involved, affected or not? Yes, mucosa is affected. Submucosa is going to be affected. So this mucosa, it will overgrow, sir. Because of this inflammation, the mucosa, it will overgrow and forms. See, this is all the mucosal, mucosal extinctions. So it's forming on this pseudo polyps. These are the pseudo polyps. These are nothing but the mucosa. So are you able to appreciate? These are the pseudo polyps that are seen. There, what is the gross morphological finding? There, the gross morphological finding is going to be cobblestone appearance. Here, what you can see is pseudopolyps. Okay, pseudopolyps are going to be seen, sir. Okay, next. What else you should know here is, sir, it involves only mucosa, submucosa, you know, it, the, the, uh, granulomas are not seen, absence of the granulomas, it's a superficial inflammation. Okay. Now, here, the important points which I want you to know is associations. If I am the person who is having this inflammatory bowel disease, that's the ulcerative colitis. If I am suffering with ulcerative colitis, there will be some liver problem. Can anyone, can anyone tell me, guys, can anyone, any one of you guys tell me, what is that liver problem that's going to occur here in this patient? Okay, hepatobiliary pathology that's going to occur, sir. Can you guys tell me what is that hepatobiliary pathology that is associated with this ulcerative colitis? Anyone? It starts. Okay, let me give you the short form. PSC. If I am the examiner, definitely I will give this question, sir, in your exam. That patient who is suffering with the inflammatory bowel disease, that is ulcerative colitis, is going to have this liver association. What is it? 
Yes, Ashutosh Sharma, you are true. It is primary sclerosing cholangitis. Okay. So, it is a primary sclerosing cholangitis. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is associated with it's a hepatobiliary condition associated with ulcerative colitis is a primary sclerosing cholangitis. Okay. Now, next what else? So, in the labs. Okay, in the labs, in the laboratory. What is seen? Sir, there in the laboratory, ASCA antibodies are seen. anti saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies are seen. So, that patient, who, this patient who is suffering with the pancolitis or ulcerative colitis is going to have which antibody positive? ANCA. Okay, perinuclear ANCA, perinuclear, okay, perinuclear ANCA, anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies, okay, anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies are going to be seen. P ANCA positivity is seen in ulcerative colitis, ASCA positivity, anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies are going to be positive in Crohn's disease, in Crohn's disease. What else, sir? What else you need to know? Sir, in histology, we go in histology, okay, of course, okay, it's a non-granulomatous inflammation. But you will see something important here. Okay, when you take the biopsy from the intestines, from the colon, what you will see here is the neutrophils. So, you know the intestines are going to have the crypts like this, right? Okay, crypts of liverkun, you know it. Now, into these crypts, lots and lots of neutrophils will come and gather here. Okay. So, these are called as crypt abscess. Okay, this is called as what? Crypt abscess. Presence of the neutrophils in the crypts. This is called as Cryptopsis. I will show you the image also. Cryptopsis is seen in. Cryptopsis is seen in. Ulcerative colitis. So, what is the radiological feature? First of all, let me show you the cryptopsis. This is, this is the normal colon. This is how the normal colon is. These are the crypts. Okay, these are the crypts. Okay, normal crypts. Now, here look, they go. Sir, cryptopsis. What is cryptopsis? See, lots and lots of neutrophils will come here. Okay. So, in the crept, in the crept, in that space, lots and lots of neutrophils will come here. On histology, this is how it's going to look like. So, this is one crept. Okay, I'm showing you in this view. In the crept, what you are seeing here, here is, see, they go, lots and lots of cells are there. So, these are the crept abscess, which are seen. Okay. So, done. Crept abscess is also completed. Next, what is the radiological feature, sir? The radiological feature, look here. How it's looking like? Sir, the radiological feature, they go, for example, here. So, so, inflammation is there, okay, but it's a continuous involvement. Now, it is looking like a lead pipe. How it is looking like? It's looking like a lead pipe, right? So, this is lead pipe appearance. Lead pipe appearance. So, lead pipe appearance is seen in ulcerative colitis. There, the appearance is going to be string of canter, string of canter. Here it is, lead pipe appearance. Okay, next. Okay. Next, what is the treatment, sir? So, the treatment for both conditions is going to be almost same. Okay, it's a, a sulfa uh, like you know, uh, there, uh, like let me tell you, here in this condition, any idea, guys? What is the treatment that is done for the Crohn's disease? Any idea what is the treatment done for the Crohn's disease? Which uh, uh, there is one monoclonal antibody, there is one monoclonal antibody. Ashutosh Sharma, you write 5 ASA, what is that 5 ASA? Now, guys, can you tell me what is that antibody? Sorry, not antibody. What is that monoclonal antibody that is used in the treatment of Crohn's disease? That is the question which was asked in one of the exam. Treatment. Let me write here the treatment. For Crohn's, what is that monoclonal antibody used? Any idea? Ashutosh, yes, infliximab. Excellent. Infliximab. Infliximab is the antibody that is used in the treatment of Crohn's disease. Now, can you tell me what is the treatment that is done for the ulcerative colitis? What is the treatment that is done for the ulcerative colitis? Any idea? It's, it is, okay, Ashutosh, you are saying, okay, 5 amino salicylic acid, okay, yes, okay, that's, yeah, 5 amino salicylic acid, you are writing the short form, okay, understood, 5 amino salicylic acid, sulfasalazine, okay, This is the question which was asked in the exam. Sulfasalazine. Okay, sulfasalazine, sulfur drug. Sulfasalazine is used in the treatment of ulcerative colitis. 5 amino salicylic acid. Okay, can be used. These are the drugs which can be used in the treatment. 
Okay, so histology image based question script abscess is going to be script abscess is going to be seen, sir. Okay, now let me ask you one more thing, sir. Association, sir. Crohn's disease is associated with what? Crohn's disease is associated with the primary sclerosing cholangitis. Okay, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now, this ulcerative colitis it is associated with any idea, guys? Let me write ulcerative colitis is associated with. Any idea, Ashutosh? I hope you can answer. Ashutosh, can you tell me? Ulcerative colitis is associated with? Any ideas? Ashutosh, fun mode. No, no, not pan colitis. It's associated with, sir. It's sprung disease or megacolon. Okay, megacolon, sir. So that's not that important anyway. Let's see out of the differences. Now let's talk about the differences, sir. See, now I will say words, I will use the words. You just try to think about them. Okay, you just try to think about them. Sir, fistulas. Fistulas are seen in Crohn's disease. Okay, fistulas are seen in Crohn's disease. Fistulas are the hallmark. Okay, crept abscess. Ah, sir, cryptopsis is seen in ulcerative colitis, primary sclerosis in cholangitis, primary sclerosis in cholangitis, Crohn's disease. Okay, next, pseudopolyps. Okay, pseudopolyps, ulcerative pseudopolyps, uh, ulcerative colitis, simple ulcerative colitis, transmural inflammation, transmural inflammation, transmural inflammation means all the layers are involved, Crohn's disease, skip lesions, Crohn's disease, creeping fat appearance. Crohn's disease, stricher formation, Crohn's disease, string of canter sign, Crohn's disease, infleximab, Crohn's disease, granulomatous inflammation, Crohn's disease. Then what are the important points about the colitis, ulcerative colitis, superficial inflammation, pan colitis, continuous involvement, okay, continuous involvement will be seen, okay, non-granulomatous inflammation, superficial inflammation, lead pipe sign is going to be seen. On radiology, lead pipe sign is going to be seen. On histology, crept abscess is going to be seen. Okay? Crept abscess is going to be seen. Treatment, 5 amino salicylic acid as well as sulfa salazine along with that steroids can be used. Okay? So, these are, the, these are some important points which I want you to know, sir. Okay? So, these two inflammatory bowel disorders are also completed. Now, what is the antibody that is present in the Crohn's disease? What is the antibody that is present in the Crohn's disease? The antibody that is present in the Crohn's disease, sir, anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody. Then what is the antibody which is present in the ulcerative colitis? It is P. anca. Okay, P. anca. So both this, both this disorder, sir, Crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis, both these disorders can lead to cancers. Both these disorders can lead to uh, colon cancer, sir. Okay, they can lead to the carcinoma, intestinal cancers, intestinal cancers, I should say, both of them can lead to the intestinal cancers, okay, both are risk factors, okay, so, inflammatory bowel disease, in general, I am telling you, inflammatory bowel diseases can lead to cancers, okay, that, both are completed, sir, okay, now, let us continue with the topic of polyps, now, colonic polyps, sir, now, let us complete the topic of the polyps, do you know right polyp? Polyp is a growth, growth, a mushroom like growth into the intestines. Now, how many types of polyps are there? My question to you. How many types of polyps are there? So, there are non neoplastic polyps. So, for especially in EPG exams, these are very, this is a very important area non neoplastic polyps and neoplastic polyps. Neoplastic polyps. Okay, non-neoplastic and neoplastic. Now, you can ask me, sir, what are non-neoplastic polyps? Non-neoplastic polyps means usually they do not turn into cancer. They do not turn into cancer, sir. Then what are the neoplastic can, uh, polyps? They will turn into cancers. Now, what are the examples? What are the examples of non-neoplastic polyps? There are three types. What are they? They are inflammatory polyps. Because of some inflammatory pathology, inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease, pseudo polyps you have seen. Okay, like that. Okay, inflammatory polyps means because of some inflammatory process, the mucosa is going to grow and form the polyps. Inflammatory polyps. Next, 
हाइपर प्लास्टिक पॉलिप्स इन्फ्लामेटरी पॉलिप्स हाइपर प्लास्टिक पॉलिप्स एंड लास्ट वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट हमारोमैटस हमारोमैटस पॉलिप्स दिस इज द इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक फॉर द एग्जाम सर ओके सो दे विल आस्क विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज एन एग्जाम्पल ऑफ नियो प्लास्टिक पॉलिप You should know what are the non-neoplastic polyps. If you know three non-neoplastic polyps, everything else are the neoplastic polyps. Simple, inflammatory polyps, hyperplastic polyps, and hematomatous polyps. These three are non-neoplastic polyps. Usually, they do not turn into cancer. Then now you will get a question. What are the neoplastic polyps? Sir? Neoplastic polyps include, which means they will turn into cancers. These polyps will turn into cancer. Tubula, adenoma, tubular adenoma. Next. Villus adenoma, right now they are not cancers, they will turn into cancers, okay, next tubular villus, tubular villus, adenoma, okay, tubular villus adenoma, next sessile, serrated polyps sorry sessile serrated adenoma and last but not the least it's a fap okay it's a fap sir what is fap familial adenomatous polyposis this is a condition familial adenomatous polyposis sir in this condition familial adenomatous polyposis there will be hundreds and thousands of polyps that are going to grow in the intestines all their examples of neoplastic polyps they will turn into cancers Okay, they will turn into cancers, sir. Hundred percent, they will turn into cancers. If you leave them, they will turn into cancers. So, what are the examples of non-neoplastic polyps? Three types: inflammatory, hyperplastic, as well as hematomatous polyps. And what are the examples of non-neoplastic polyps? Non-neoplastic polyps include tubular adenoma, villus adenoma, tubular villus adenomas, sessile serrated adenomas, and familial adenomatous polyposis. These polyps, which are seen in the familial adenomatous polyposis, they are all neoplastic polyps. They will turn into cancers. Okay, they will turn into cancers. Okay. Now, having said that, now let's begin with the non-neoplastic polyps. Okay. Now, hyperplastic polyp is first. Let's begin with the hyperplastic polyp. Okay, hyperplasia because of the hyperplasia. Okay. So, look here, the one which I am showing you right now. Okay, this one. So, this is an example of hyperplastic polyp. Okay. See, you can see the polyps. Okay. Hyper plastic polyp. They will ask you to identify the image. Okay, identify the image. They will give you this biopsy and they will ask you to identify this image. So it was taken from a polyp. They will say the patient is having per rectal bleeding. The patient is having bleeding, and you have taken the you have done like you know for example colonoscopy. You have done the colonoscopy. You have seen this polyps. You have seen a polyp. So this is the polyp. Now you have taken a biopsy. Okay, now you have taken a biopsy and this is how the biopsy is looking like. Now. Sir, what is this polyp? Is it an example of neoplastic polyp, non-neoplastic polyp, hematomatous polyp, inflammatory polyp, or is it an example of hyperplastic polyp? How to know? How to know? Is, देखो, in the topmost layer, okay, sir, in the upper parts of the script, see, see there is serrations, there is serrated upper crypts. Now you can see very clearly, see, there is serrations, sir, like this, which is branching. Like this. So there is going to be serrated upper crypt. Okay, sir. Right, hyperplastic polyps. They are mainly seen in uh, sixty years. Older individuals that seen uh, sixty uh, sixty years. Most common site is going to be rectum. The okay, most common site is going to be rectum. On biopsy, followed by histology. What you will see? Okay, on microscopic examination. So you have done the biopsy and you are doing the microscopic examination. There is going to be serrated upper crypts. Upper serrations means branching appearance. Serrated upper crypts are going to be seen. But if you look at the base, you look at the base. The base, the crypts are going to be narrow and uniform. See, now they are more narrow. Okay, they are more narrow. And they are almost uniform, sir. Okay, like see. Okay, there are no serrations. Okay, so they'll be narrow, uniform,
okay narrow uniform basal crypts so this is how you need to identify the hyperplastic polyps hyperplastic polyps in the 60 years of age most common site is the rectum these are non neoplastic polyps they do not turn into the cancer on histology how you have to identify is so the supermost superficial area is going to show the serrated appearance serrated crypts okay serrated crypts but the basal area is going to be narrow okay narrow round okay see they go round basal crypts okay uniform uniformity is there okay done sir so this is how you have to identify now next for example look at this image so look at this image so this is also a polyp okay this is also a polyp look here now in the uppermost part serrations are there okay serrations are there now even the serrations are coming to the base also okay serrations are seen in the base also sir they are not regular even the serrations are seen in the base also okay everywhere it is serrated now look here there is a very clear demarcation upper the serrations are going to be seen in the upper part but in the base they are all uniform uniform crepts are seen almost almost but here see the everywhere more more number of serrations are there in the upper as well as basal area also upper as well as basal area also okay now even see the crypts are going to look like a boot shape okay the crypts are looking more like a boot shape sir or sometimes sometimes the crypts will look like inverted t shape they will look like inverted t shapes sir so what are these polyps what are these polyps so the polyp which i am talking right now image us question important okay whenever you see such kind of histology this is an example of sessile Okay, this is SSI serrated adenoma. Okay, SSI serrated adenoma. Now, where we have said about the SSI serrated adenoma, sir? So, the SSI serrated adenomas are seen here. They are the example of neoplastic polyps. Okay, so how to differentiate between a hyperplastic polyp and how to differentiate between a SSI serrated adenoma is the look at the base and apex. Look at look at the base. base as well as the upper part upper region and lower region whenever you see a boot shaped boot shaped or inverted t shaped crepts the serrations are present in the upper crepts as well as the lower crepts that's an example of sessile serrated adenoma but upper crepts are going to be serrated the basal crepts are going to be uniform then it is example of hyperplastic polyps okay so right here sessile serrated adenoma is an example of neoplastic polyp is an example of neoplastic polyp okay serrated serrations extend to the base of the crypt okay serrations extend to the base of the crypt serrations extend to the base of the crypt now the scripts are going to be dilated okay now they are going to be inverted t shape or boot shape okay they are going to be inverted t shape or boot shape crepts are going to be seen in the lower area okay so done so with this this one completed okay so hyperplastic polyp is completed sir now we have to discuss about we have to discuss about hamartomatous polyps so there are many conditions there are many conditions not one condition there are many conditions in which this hamartomatous polyps are seen okay hamartomatous polyps are seen in multiple conditions okay multiple conditions now you will get it out sir what exactly is a hamartomatous polyp you can ask me see sir the patient is going to have see they go hamartomatous polyps okay again hamartomatous polyps here also see, colonic hamartomatous polyps so hamartomatous polyps are seen in multiple conditions sir now first of all right hamartomatous polyps now question is what exactly is a hamartoma sir eh? hamartoma hai kya hai what exactly is a hamartoma hamartoma means sir it's a tumor okay 
a mass of mature tissue, okay, right, a mass of mature, not immature, mature only, a mass of mature but disorganized tissue. Okay, disorganized tissue native to the organ. For example, Riku, now in the colon, there is a tumor growing, hematomatous polyp growing. Hematoma means what? It's in the colon, not a cartilaginous material is growing, not a bone material is growing, not a skin, skin material is coming. Okay, they are called as a teratomas, they are different. Amartoma means same tissue, same tissue only in the colon, same colonic tissue is only growing, but disorganized, totally it is disorganized. Okay, so disorganization in the tissue, it is called as hamartomatous polyp. Disorganized tissue is growing. That is called as a hamartomatous polyps or hamartoma. Okay, now tell me. So this hamartomatous polyps, hamartomatous intestinal polyps or colonic polyps are seen in which conditions? There are three conditions. One is Peutz-Zeiger syndrome. Okay, Peutz-Zeiger syndrome is one condition or Peutz-Zeiger syndrome. Okay. Tiger syndrome. Next, juvenile polyposis. Juvenile polyposis is one more condition. Next, Cowden syndrome or Cowden disease. Okay, three conditions. So, in your exam, the question can be like, all of the following conditions shows the hematomatous polyps in the intestines except. So, you should know juvenile polyposis, Cowden syndrome, as well as the Pewteger syndrome or Pewteger syndrome. These conditions are going to show the hematomatous polyps. Okay, having said that, now let's begin with the first condition. First, let's begin with the juvenile. Okay, first, let's begin with the juvenile. This one, sir. Okay, juvenile. Okay, juvenile polyposis. Juvenile polyposis. Now, in these patients, there are going to be like polyps are everywhere. Okay, M multiple places the polyps are going to be seen. Most common side is going to be rectum. So, these are also called as juvenile rectal polyp. If the polyp is present in the rectum, it is called as a juvenile rectal polyp. But many places the polyps can be there. Most common side is going to be rectum, sir. Okay. Now, tell me, juvenile rectal polyp or juvenile polyposis, what kind of polyps are they? So they are not inflammatory polyps. They are not hyperplastic polyps. They are hamartomatous polyps. They are hamartomas. Are they cancers? Are they cancers? They are non-neoplastic polyps. They are not the cancers. They are non-neoplastic polyps. They do not turn into cancers. So, this juvenile rectal polyp also do not turn into cancers. So there is a polyp in the rectum. Okay. Multiple polyps are seen in many places. But these polyps will never turn into cancer. Okay. Hamartomatous polyps. Okay. What is the most common site? Rectum. Okay. I have explained with you. Okay, there are more than five polyps, that's a diagnostic, sir. Okay, juvenile uh, polyposis syndrome. Okay, now what are the clinical features? If, I, if there is a patient, okay, there is a patient, there is a child, sir. Usually it is seen in children. Okay, usually this uh, juvenile uh, rectal polyps or juvenile polyposis, in the name itself, they, they, they call juvenile. It is seen less than five years. Okay, less than five years. If you have more than five polyps, if you have more than five polyps, that's a diagnostic, that's a diagnostic criteria. What are the clinical features? Any idea, guys? Any idea what are the clinical features? Sir, these polyps, they will bleed, sir. They will bleed. So, that is hemato. That is a hematochesia. Hematochesia. Or hematochesia. Hematochesia means what? Fresh bleeding. Fresh bleeding that is coming out of the stools. Okay, fresh bleeding that is coming out. Okay, hematochesia. Or bleeding per rectum, we can say. Okay, hematochesia. So, as the, as the, as the person is losing a lot of blood, the patient is going to present with what? Iron deficiency anemia. The features of iron deficiency anemia. Anemic symptoms are going to be seen. Okay. Anemic symptoms. So, the patient is going to have the hematochesia. Anemic symptoms are going to be seen. Most common side is going to be rectum. Seen in less than 5 years. More than 5 polyps in the colon or the rectum is a diagnostic. Is a diagnostic. Now, question is, why? Why this juvenile polyposis? Why? What's wrong? So, mutations, gene mutations. So, what are the gene mutations, sir? What are the gene mutations, okay, that are responsible for the development of this juvenile polyposis? SMAD. 
SMAD4 gene mutations and BMPR1A, BMPR1A gene mutations. So these two gene mutations are SMAD gene mutations and BMPR1A gene mutations. Look here, Deco. sir, Deco. Now, right now I am talking about juvenile polyposis. Okay, right, juvenile polyposis. Sir, this is the patient is having a polyp. Okay. Now, which gene mutations? SMAD4 and BMPR1A gene mutations. SMAD4 and BMPR1A gene mutations are the ones which are responsible for the development of this juvenile polyps. Okay, juvenile polyposis or juvenile rectal polyps. Now, what are the complications? Any complication do you know? So, these patients are going to have some complications. Extra colonic complications are going to be seen. What are they? Important. Any idea, guys? So, these patients are going to the complication. First of all, let me tell you. So, the complication means uh, before telling you about what are the extra colonic manifestations, first tell me the complication. So, these patients are at a risk of in the future, in the future, okay, they will develop colon carcinoma, sir. Okay, they will develop colon carcinoma, sir. Okay, there is a possibility. Okay, so extra colonic, sorry, not colonic, sorry. Okay, colonic or even extra colonic endocarcinoma can be seen. That's one of the complications. Colonic, okay, are extra colonic. Okay, colonic or extra colonic. What is doctor physiology of muscle cub hoting? Physiology, we will do the physiology, sir. We, are, we have also started the physiology sessions, right? Physiology of the muscle, we will do it. Okay. So, colonic or extra colonic adenocarcinoma can be developed in these patients. Okay, that's not that important, but so, these patients are going to have certain extra colonic manifestations. What are they? See, I have said, right, SMAD, SMAD gene mutation, SMAD gene mutation. So, these patients are going to have hereditary hemorrhagic, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias. Okay, so these patients not only the polyps, okay, of course, polyps are there. Okay, hematomatous polyps are there, no doubt. Not only the hematomatous polyps, these patients are going to have HHT. Hereditary, hem hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias are going to be seen in these patients. Not only that, AV malformations. Okay, AV malformations, arteriovenous malformations are going to be seen. Because of this AV malformation, the patient is even having distal. Okay. Digital clubbing. The digital clubbing can be seen. Okay. So these patients are going to have, okay, rather than polyps, rather than polyps, these patients can also have hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias, AV malformations can be seen, and digital clubbing can be seen, sir. Okay. So these are some important points about juvenile polyposis or juvenile, okay, juvenile um, rectal polyp. So, hematomatous polyps, hematomatous polyps, see they go here, these patients are going to have hematomatous, this juvenile polyposis, the patient is going to have digestive hematomatous polyps, okay. But these patients can also develop gastrointestinal cancers, they go, they can develop the cancers, true. Of course, they are hematomatous polyps, non-neoplastic polyps, okay. But, in this juvenile polyposis, these patients can develop future cancers, true. What are the gene mutations? The gene mutations are SMAD, SMAD, okay, SMAD4 and BMP, BMPR1A gene mutations, BMPR1A gene mutations are seen. If you look at the histology, they go, if you look at the histology, what you are seeing is, so there are lot of cysts are going to be seen in this polyps, okay, lot of cystic dilatations, lot of cysts which are filled with the mucin, mucin filled cysts are going to be seen, okay, look here, so, for example, if you do the biopsy, so actually this is a biopsy of a polyp which was taken from the stomachs and not from the rectum, but anyway, just telling you, Juvenile polyposis, in juvenile polyposis, these juvenile polyps are going to have lots of cyst, cystic dilations, okay, cystic dilations are going to be seen, okay, so that is a very important point I want you to know, cystic dilations. Now, after this, let's talk about the second hematomatous polyps, we have completed this, 
Okay, we have completed juvenile polyposis. Less than five years of age. Hematochezia is going to be seen. Iron deficiency anemia in a baby. Okay, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias. Uh, AV malformations. Okay, SMAD SMAD four gene mutations. Okay, BP PMPR one A gene mutations. Cystic dilatations in the histology. Yeah. Next polyp which I want you to know is Peutz-Jeghers syndrome. Okay, Peutz-Jeghers syndrome. Sir, even in this Peutz-Jeghers syndrome, they go, the patient is going to have gastrointestinal hematomatous polyps. Gastrointestinal hematomatous polyps. Sir. Not only that, these patients are going to have mucocutaneous, they call mucocutaneous pigmentation. The patient is going to have the mucocutaneous pigmentation. Okay, polyps are seen, they call. Now, look at this polyp, how it is looking like. It's more looking like a tree, right? It's more looking like a branching tree. Okay, branching appearance is going to be seen. And this is because of SK, sorry, STK 11 gene mutation. Okay, STK 11 gene mutation. We'll write one by one. All these points we'll write one by one. The second hematomatous polyps, the second condition in which the hematomatous polyps are seen, it is the Peutz-Jeghers syndrome. What's the most common location of the polyps? In Peutz-Jeghers syndrome, the most common location is going to be jejunum. Okay. Most common location is going to be jejunum, sir. So the patient is going to have multiple, multiple hamartomatous polyps. Multiple hamartomatous polyps are going to be seen. Not only that, if you look, the patient is going to have, okay, pigmentation, mucocutaneous pigmentation. Okay, the patient is going to have mucocutaneous pigmentation. Okay, mucocutaneous pigmentation is going to be seen. So, what is the gene mutation that is going to cause this multiple hematomatous polyps? It's a STK gene mutation, STK gene, STK11 sir, STK11 gene mutation. Okay, STK11 gene mutation sir, usually the family history is going to be positive. Okay, in the family also, is, uh, the patient, some like you know family relatives are going to have the same Peutz-Jeghers syndrome, positive familial history. Family history will be positive. Even for the juvenile polyposis also, even for the juvenile polyposis also, family history is going to be positive. Okay. So, someone uh, like you know have a doubt. So, what is this STK? Sir, STK means serine threonine kinase. Okay, serine threonine kinase. Okay, serine threonine kinase is like you know, it's a Genes are STK, STK11 gene mutation. Okay. So, next. Sir, if you look at the biopsy, important image based question. If you look at the biopsy, sir, are you able to appreciate, sir, there is a branching appearance, tree like appearance. The most characteristic finding, they go here also. So, the most characteristic finding is the presence of arbor is like you know, arborizing. Arborizing means like branches. Okay, arborizing network of lamina propria, glands, smooth muscles, and connective tissue. Okay, this is not important. This term is important, sir. Arborizing network. Network, arborizing network means like a branches. Okay, like a branches. Look here, how it, how beautiful it is. Okay, but the condition is not beautiful, sir. Okay, Peutz-Jeghers syndrome. Peutz-Jeghers syndrome, in this condition, what you are going to see? You are going to see hematomatous polyps, non-neoplastic polyps are seen. What is the most common site? Jujunum. The patient is going to have mucocutaneous lentigenosis. Okay, here, you, this is also classical image. They go. Okay, mucocutaneous pigmentation here also the arborizing network arborizing network is seen in the biopsy okay arborizing network so here they go polyps hematomatous polyps are seen okay so done sir the second hematomatous polyp condition first condition juvenile rectal polyp or juvenile polyposis is completed next condition Peutz-Jeghers syndrome this is also completed the patient is going to have mucocutaneous pigmentation and gastrointestinal hematomatous polyps but also remember a very important point so these patients will also in the future these patients are also at risk of developing colorectal cancer okay the patients are at risk of colorectal and gynecological cancers possible okay possibility is there okay next after this what is the third condition that you should know the third condition is cowden syndrome cowden syndrome so it's starting with which, which word cow so, always I think about the cow, sir. Cowden syndrome. Okay. So, let's see about the Cowden syndrome. First point, sir, Cowden syndrome. Are you going to have, in Cowden syndrome, are you going to have 
the hyperplastic polyps or inflammatory polyps or hematomatous polyps. If you are suffering with Cowden syndrome, you are going to have hematomatous polyps. Okay, hematomatous polyps. So, Cowden, den, I used to remember like 10. Den, like 10. Okay, so what is the gene mutation? Now, just as a recap, just as a recap, Deco. Sir, in juvenile polyposis, in juvenile polyposis, there is SMAD, S M A D, SMAD 4 gene mutation. Okay, now, why to unnecessarily make you think? See, look here, sir, it's a SMAD, SMAD 4 gene mutation, BMPR 1A gene mutation, juvenile polyposis, BMPR 1A gene mutation, SMAD 4 gene mutations in juvenile, uh, in this uh, Peutz-Jäger syndrome. In Peutz-Jäger syndrome, there is HTK, serine, threonine, kinase, 11 gene mutations. Now, the last one, sir, the Cowden. Deco, what is the gene mutation? P10 gene mutation. Okay, the gene mutation is P10 gene mutation. If this P10 gene is mutated, now do you know what happens? If the P10 gene is mutated, sir, right, the patient, yes, I used to look like, like, you know, think about a cow. Now I used to just think about the cow. Now why cow? Cow? What do we take from the cow? We are going to take milk from the cow. From where the milk is going to come? Milk is going to come from the breast. It's the udder breast, right? That's the cow's breast, right? Now, the cow, milk, milk comes from breast, breast cancer. So, that's how I used to remember. In Cowden syndrome, the female is going to develop the breast cancer. Of course, yes, multiple hematomatous polyps are seen. Multiple hematomatous polyps are going to be seen in the colon, the stomach. Yes, possible. So, multiple hematomatous polyps are going to be seen in the gastrointestinal tract. Apart from Apart from the hematomatous polyps, these patients are at risk of developing breast cancer. Okay, breast cancer, very high risk, they go, very high risk of breast cancer. Okay, not only that, when you see a cow, cow is going to have this bell, right? Bell in its neck. Okay, so who, what is there in the neck? Thyroid, thyroid gland. So there is a chance of thyroid cancer. Okay, so P10 gene mutations, right? P10. Gene mutations are associated with breast cancer through thyroid cancer through as well as these patients will develop endometrial cancer. Okay, endometrial cancer, sir. That is the uterine cancer. Okay. Endometrial cancer. True. Endometrial carcinoma. True. So there are three cancers. Three cancers. Apart from cancers, these patients are going to have non-neoplastic polyps, that is the hematopatous polyps, multiple hematomatous polyps are seen in the gastrointestinal tract, okay, multiple hematomatous, okay, multiple hematomatous polyps are going to be seen, okay, in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, apart from that, anything else is going to be seen? So, these patients are also going to have, this is something important, so cow is going to, like, you know, how it is going to shout, Move, right? Cow is going to do the move. Okay. So, trichelemomas. What exactly is a trichelemoma? Trichelemoma is a benign tumor of the hair follicles. It's a, it's a benign tumor of the hair follicles. Okay. So, trichelemomas are also seen. Very important. Okay. Trichelemomas are associated with, are seen in which condition? Cowden disease or Cowden syndrome. What is the gene mutation? P10 gene mutation. If the P10 gene it is mutated, if, the, if there is a P10 gene mutation, there is a breast cancer, there is a risk of thyroid cancer, there is a risk of endometrial cancer, and the patient is going to have multiple hematomatous polyps in the gastrointestinal tract, the patient is going to have trichelemomas. Okay, trichelemomas, which are the benign tumor of the hair follicles. Okay. Yeah. So, completed the three conditions in which you are going to see the hematomatous polyps. What are the non-neoplastic polyps? Just wait. Look here. We have discussed non-neoplastic polyps, inflammatory polyps, seen in inflammatory conditions, hyperplastic polyps. I have shown you the image, hyperplastic polyps, above serrated appearance, below round appearance, above serrated appearance, below narrow uniformic appearance. Completed. Now, hematomatous polyps. Just tell me, what are three conditions in which hematomatous polyps are seen? Hematomatous polyps are seen in first Pute Zeger syndrome. Pute Zeger syndrome. Okay, mucocutaneous pigmentation, don't forget. Second condition, juvenile polyposis or juvenile rectal polyp. Juvenile polyposis. In a condition called as juvenile polyposis, SMAD4 gene mutation. Okay, you are going to see the hematomatous polyps. The last one, Cowden syndrome. 
Okay, in Cowden syndrome, P10 gene mutation. Cowden, P10, Cowden, P10, cow in a pen. Okay, I used to remember like a cow in a pen, sir. Okay, the P10 gene mutation. Done. Is there is any other condition? Okay, are there any other conditions in which you are going to see? Okay, in which you are going to see this hematomatous polyps? Any other condition in which you are going to see the hematomatous polyps? Any any other condition, guys? Any other condition? Do you know? Any other condition? Yes, croconite. And what you are saying? Cronkite. Yes, of course. Okay, cronkite. Sorry. So, any other conditions? Let me write here. Now, tuberous sclerosis. The fourth condition which I am writing, tubero sclerosis. In a tuberous sclerosis, the patient is going to develop yes, hematomas, polyps, hematomas. Okay, so tuberous sclerosis is the one condition in which the patient is going to develop the hematomas or hematomatous polyps are going to be seen. What is the gene mutation in tuberous sclerosis? TSC. TSC gene mutation. Okay, TSC1 and TSC2. There are these two. See, tuberous sclerosis. TSC means tuberous sclerosis. One gene mutation and tuberous sclerosis two gene mutation can lead to the hematomas. And uh, yeah. One more you are saying cronkite. Okay, the, the next condition is going to be cronkite, sir. Okay, C R O N cron kite K H I T cronkite Canada syndrome. Okay, so cronkite Canada syndrome. So what exactly happens is cronkite Canada syndrome. Okay, let me show you first of all. See, look here, sir. In this condition, cronkite Canada syndrome. देखो, the patient is going to have. Okay. Nail involvement, sir. Nail involvement. Yes, of course, hematomatous polyps are, not, are going to be seen, no doubt. See, they go. In Cronkite, Canada syndrome, the patient is going to have the hematomas. Hematomas are seen, okay, no doubt. Apart from hematomas, the patient is also going to have, see, cutaneous pigmentation. Okay, skin involvement is going to be there. Alopecia, loss of hair, hair loss is going to be seen. And nail involvement, okay. Nail involvement, sir. Okay, nail involvement, there will be dystrophy, okay, sometimes even atrophy, sir. See, they go, the nail involvement is going to be seen. There is a hyperpigmentation of the palms and soles, hyperpigmentation of the palms and soles. The patient is going to have hair loss, hair loss is going to be seen. Okay, onychodystrophy, onychodystrophy, onychodystrophy means dystrophy of the nails. Onychodystrophy is going to be seen. Loss of hairs, alopecia, hyperpigmentation along with Okay, see, these are all the important points, very, very important points. So, in Cronkite's Canada syndrome, the points which you should know is, sir, first, number one point, it is non-inherited. It's a non-inherited condition, means it's not coming in the families, it's not coming in the families, it's a non-inherited condition. No genes are going to be involved, it's an acquired condition, sir. You will get it, not from the family, you get, get it, okay. It's a non-familial, they go. Acquired, non-familial. Okay, hematomatous polyps are going to be seen. Okay, what are the associated findings important for your exam? The associated findings important for your exam are alopecia, cutaneous pigmentation, there is a dystrophy of the nails. Okay, apart from, yeah, diarrhea will be there, weight loss will be there, abdominal pain will be there because of this polyps. Okay, because of this hematomatous polyps and adenomas and the intestine, the patient is going to have diarrhea, weight loss, as well as the abdominal pain. Okay. So, these are some important points which I want you to know, sir. Cronkite Canada syndrome. Okay, Cronkite Canada syndrome. Right? It's a non-inherited condition. Non-inherited condition. Okay? So, what are the conditions in which you are going to see the hematomatous polyps? The condition which the, in which the hematomatous polyps are seen are juvenile rectal polyps or juvenile polyposis, Fugdegger syndrome, Cowden syndrome, Tuberous sclerosis, tuberous sclerosis and Cronkite Canada syndrome, Cronkite Canada syndrome, okay. So, these are the conditions. If you know this much, more than enough, sir, more than enough. So, hematomatous polyps are also completed, okay, hematomatous polyps are also completed. Now, Deco, let's come to the classification ones. So, all these are completed, right, let me write here. Uh, Pierzega syndrome, zonal polyposis, Cowden syndrome, tuberous sclerosis as well as Cronkite Canada 
syndrome, Cronkite Canada syndrome. Okay, done. All these are examples of hematomatous polyps. Now, in neoplastic polyps, I have already discussed about the sessile serrated adenoma. Sessile serrated adenoma, sir, like this. Inverted T shape or boot shape is going to be seen. Okay, now for your exam, sir, this familial adenomatous polyposis is there, right? This is very, very important, sir. This is very, very important. Familial adenomatous polyposis. Super important topic, sir. Okay, so now let me write important points about the familial adenomatous polyposis. Right? FAP, familial, adenomatous, polyposis. So polyposis, see, many polyps are going to be seen, not one and two, hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands of polyps are going to be seen, sir. So this FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, even in genetics I have discussed, it's an autosomal dominant disorder. Okay, autosomal dominant disorder. With 100% penetrance, sir, 100% penetrance, if I have this disease, familial adenomatous polyposis, 100% I will develop the cancer, sir. 100% I will develop the cancer. Okay, 100% there is a risk of cancer. Okay, 100% penetrance, familial adenomatous polyposis. Now, what is the gene mutation? What is the gene mutation? Familial adenomatous polyposis, what is the gene mutation? APC gene mutation, sir, APC gene mutation. Okay, APC gene mutation. So, this APC gene, it is present on chromosome number 5, Q21. Okay, chromosome number 5, Q21. That is the locus, that is the locus of this gene. Okay, 5, Q21, APC gene is present on the chromosome number 5, Q21 region, like, you know, band, subband, you know. Okay, so 5, Q21 is the locus for the APC gene. Okay, now, let me tell you here itself. Sir, this is autosomal dominant, right? Familial adenomatous polyposis is autosomal dominant. But there is one thing which is autosomal recessive. Autosomal recessive FAP. Familial adenomatous polyposis. Autosomal recessive familial adenomatous polyposis. In this condition, less number of polyps are going to be seen. Less, less severe condition, sir. Let me tell you. Sir, here, in autosomal dominant variety, there are at least, at least, more than 100 polyps. At least more than 100 polyps are going to be seen. So not just 100, hundreds, 500, thousands, thousands of thousands of polyps are going to be seen. At least 100, more than 100 polyps are going to be seen. But in this autosomal recessive familial endomatous polyposis, less than 100 polyps are seen. Now, this autosomal recessive FAP, okay, autosomal recessive FAP, it is because of which gene mutation, not APC gene mutation, sir. It is not because of the IPC gene mutation. It is because of MUTYH. This is the gene, sir. MUTYH gene mutation. Important? Yes, important. See, MUTYH, MUTYH gene mutation is going to cause autosomal recessive familial endomatous polyposis, which is a less severe variety where the number of polyps are going to be less than 100. Okay, less than 100 polyps are going to be seen. Now, what else you should know is, first let's come to the autosomal dominant one, simple. I'm going to have 100% chance of getting a cancer, okay? From this polyps, this polyps will turn into cancer, sir. This polyps will turn into cancer, 100%. When? Less than 30 years, okay? So, young age, sir, young age is going to be affected, young age. So, now what you need to do? Whenever you are having this APC gene mutation, familial, in your family, some of your family members have this familial endomatous polyposis and you go on for your genetic genomic study and you also came to know that you are also having the same APC, okay, APC gene mutation, you are also having this polyps in your colon, you are also having this polyps, more than 100 polyps are there in your colon. Now what we need to do, we need to do the prophylactic colectomy, okay, we have to, 100% we have to go with the prophylactic. Prophylactic colectomy, sir, means we have to remove the colon. Why? Because 100% they, it will turn into cancer. So rather than, before turning into the cancer, first let's take it, take, take the, remove the colon. Otherwise, he will die with the cancer. Okay. Next. 
In this, familial adenomatous polyposis, in, uh, yeah, autosomal dominant condition, 100% penetrance, 100% risk of cancer, seen in less than 30 years of age, APC gene mutation, okay, more than 100 polyps, okay, everything is good. What are the extra colonic manifestation, rather than the colonic polyps, rather than the colonic neoplastic polyps, what else? Extra colonic manifestations. Do you know what are the extra colonic manifestations one more? It is called as CHRPE. CHRPE. Do you know what is CHRPE? This is the extra colonic manifestation. These patients will have this extra colonic manifestation. C for congenital. Okay, congenital. H for hypertrophy. Congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium. Congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium okay congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium let me show you so this is the retina in the retina are you able to appreciate this area hypertrophy of the retinal pigment the pigmented epithelium the dark color area so it's a congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium is going to be seen in fab familial adenomatous polyposis Okay, familial adenomatous polyposis, more than 100 polyps are going to be seen, associated with congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium. Okay, prophylactic colectomy will be done. Okay, otherwise, in the future, he will develop the cancer and he will die with that cancer. Okay, with that cancer, he will die, sir. Now, let me tell you some important variants, some important little variations, sir, variants, variants of, variants of, Familial adenomatous polyposis. They are the variants of the familial adenomatous polyposis. What are they? The first variant is called as Gardner syndrome. Gardner syndrome. Okay, Gardner syndrome. Okay, I have, what exactly is this Gardner syndrome, sir? It's a variant of familial adenomatous polyposis. It also follows the autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Okay, now what are the gene mutations here? Same gene mutations, APC gene mutation. Apart from APC gene mutations here, you can also have RAS gene mutation, P53 gene mutations are seen. Okay, apart from this, APC gene mutation, RAS gene mutations and P53 gene mutations can be seen. Okay, now what you will have, what is this Gardner syndrome? Yes, multiple, right, multiple polyps. Okay, multiple neoplastic polyps in the colon. Hundreds and thousands of polyps are seen. Numerous adenomatous polyps are numerous adenomatous polyps are seen in the colon. Okay. But apart from this, in Gardner syndrome, apart from FAP, apart from familial adenomatous polyposis, apart from adenomatous polyps in the colon, these patients are going to have other features. Tumors outside the colon, right? Tumors outside colon. Which tumors are seen outside the colon? Fibromas. The patients are going to have fibromas. The patients are going to have osteomas. The patients are going to have epi epidermoid cyst. Okay, epidermoid cysts. Okay, the patients are going to have epidermoid cysts, fibromas, osteomas, and even the patients are going to have lipomas. These patients will have desmoid tumors. Means multiple, multiple tumors are seen. Apart from the colonic tumors, apart from the colonic polyps, other tumors are also seen. Especially important, osteomas. This is what I asked in the exam. The patients are going to have osteomas, fibromas, along with the multiple polyps in the colon. It's a variant, it's a variant of the familial endomatous polyposis. That syndrome is called as the Gardner syndrome, which is autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, APC gene mutation, RAS gene mutation, P53 gene mutations. Okay, so these are some important points I want you to know. Apart from this, one more thing, these patients are also going to have multiple number of teeth. Extra teeth are going to be there. Extra teeth. Okay, one more thing. These patients are also going to have the extra teeth. Okay, so colonic polyps and other tumors. Not only colonic polyps, these patients are also going to have stomach polyps, duodenal polyps, pancreatic polyps, okay, kidney polyps, multiple things are going to be seen, sir. Okay. And yeah, these patients are also going to have congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium. This is also seen here. 
because it's a variant of fab this is nothing but a fab but extra tumors that's it because of extra mutations extra tumors okay that's it done now one more variety the second variant of fab second variant of fab the second variant of fab it is called as okay turcot syndrome turcot syndrome now in this turcot syndrome what the patient is going to have simple multiple polyps the patient is going to have the multiple polyps multiple colonic polyps are going to be seen along with that the patient is going to have congenital hypertrophy of congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium the dot i have seen on the retina that's going to be seen anyway apart from this the patient is going to have a cns tumor sir the patient is going to have glioblastoma multiforme glioblastoma tumor okay glioblastoma the patient is going to have glioblastoma or medulloblastoma okay so the cns involvement is going to be there fap with cns involvement fap with a neural involvement they go fap with a neural involvement it is a turcot syndrome fap see now here fap with bone involvement osteomas fibromas epidermoid cysts lipomas desmoid tumors with multiple number of teeth with congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium that is what that is that is not turcot that is uh, gardner syndrome okay gardner syndrome so gardner syndrome and turcot syndrome they are nothing but variants of fap sir okay they are nothing but the variants of fap okay so with this Familial endomatous polyposis is also completed. Remember, familial endomatous polyposis, important gene, APC gene mutation, PyQ21 is the locus. Okay, so polyps, colonic polyps topic is also completed. What we are left with is the colon cancer. Okay, colon cancer is uh, left over that we can do in the tomorrow session. Okay, colon cancer we'll do in tomorrow session and we'll start the new chapter, sir. From tomorrow, we can start the new chapter. Okay, most probably I will start the respiratory pathology. Okay, respiratory pathology will be uh, started from the tomorrow's class. Okay. Hope the class is helpful. Okay. Fun mode, mountain life, fun mode, Metroid. Okay, learning campus. Okay. Thank you. I like the way of teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, tomorrow let's complete uh, the colon cancer and let's go with the respiratory. Okay, guys, see you for today. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you.